You're listening to the really useful podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley. He's Gavin Phillips. And this week, we have got an entire show devoted to the topic of use of AI to make well, create text and art, I suppose. Yeah, I think what, what people are calling it in general, uh, this is uh, generative AI. Yeah. Um, and like, like you said there, it's um, using um, artificial intelligence uh, to create, like you said, new artwork or text that hasn't been seen before uh, to answer questions. Um, and and as as we're going to talk about in a minute, um, people are getting generative AI to, to to do programming to solve problems uh, and all sorts of other things. So AI and uh, OpenAI in particular, their creation ChatGPT, have been in the news quite a bit recently. Uh, so I'm going to kick off with a news story. Google has had its cage rattled. By all of this basically they've been working on ai technology for a while it's it's been publicly announced and then uh, open ai's product comes along and it's not really a product at this stage is it oh, oh actually we'll come on to that later i suppose um and uh, google have created uh an ai called bard posited to compete with chat gpt and it's basically a a chat gpt style ai which you can uh, expect human sounding responses from based on the prompts or inputs that you give to it uh, now i I'm, I'm going to be honest here gavin knows a bit more about the ai creation generative stuff than i do i've had a little bit of a play with it over the past few weeks but uh, gavin has had the pleasure of reading a lot of material about it on make use of so uh, you'll find links to what we discuss in the show notes of course um google ceo sundar pichai uh revealed bard on google's the keyword blog earlier this week um now, ChatGPT goes back to November 30th, 2022. That's when it was released after a lengthy development period. They kind of took everyone by surprise. By I'm, I don't know if if there's some underhand sort of, oh, we'll, we'll be releasing this in six months' time, whatever, and then they decide, we'll put it out next week and see what happens. Uh, whether that happened or not, I'm not really certain. But it's really shook things up, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. To the point where, um, so with Google Bard, it was quite evident that, Google were not prepared to release this. Uh, yeah. And ChatGPT, OpenAI's ChatGPT, forced their hand big time. And basically, they had to release a product that definitely works. You know, it does its thing. But um, during its first ever run out, um, during its first ever demonstration, uh, eagle eyed uh, watchers realized that it had made a, a massive mistake <laughs> uh, for the information that it gave so that one of the demonstration questions was on uh, the James Webb telescope and it said could you give me some facts or you know on the James Webb telescope um, and it gave some very wrong information saying that oh it was the that the James Webb Space Telescope was the first one to take a picture of a planet outside our solar system an exoplanet um, and people quite quickly said but actually that was done in 2004 donkeys before the James mm. Webb Space Telescope was launched so um, that was a quite an interesting look into a Google Bard, um, you know, throwing up something completely wrong and presenting it as a fact. Um, and also, quite clearly, Google's product was not ready to go at that point. Yeah. Uh, now, Google's Bard uses a thing called Lambda, Language Model for Dialogue Applications. And, I mean, that sounds completely sensible enough because you know google has been pushed we, you know we've had we've, we've been able to give voice commands to google products for years you know i regularly write blog posts for my website using uh, text to speak a uh, voice to text conversion so you know it, it has the technology to do that and but the fact that it got that so badly wrong when essentially i mean it's, you know, google has the entire internet in its back pocket doesn't it so that's yeah. quite amusing, really, what you've just explained. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why people found it so surprising because like you said, Google has all the information in the entire world available and a very basic fact check would have fixed that. But not only that, it was that they presented the product. It wasn't like it was a live presentation done on a stage in front of an audience. This was something that was recorded and then posted in a blog post and then to Twitter. So there were so many stages <laughs> where someone could have gone, oh, hold on a minute, let's just <laughs> make sure our machine is spitting out the right information. But the wider picture, I think, Christian, um, of Google Bard presenting something as fact when it was patently false is that a lot of people, once these generative AI tools start integrating closer into internet search, which, you know, we all... I mean, I guess we all trust to a degree because we continue using it, you know, yeah. rightly or wrongly for the flaws that Google has. You know, we use it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and more and more people are going to start using generative AI tools like this. Uh, but then it's going to put the onus even more on double checking the facts that are presented to you, especially if it reels out the information um, in a really nicely crafted uh, pros, you know, it's not like when you do a Google search and it's a long list of links and you look through the links, don't you? And go, oh, I'll click that, I'll click that. Yeah. With this, it presents all of the information you need on your screen immediately. So it, it almost tricks your mind into going, well, it's been written perfectly. So, you know, it must be correct. <laughs> Now, you probably know about AI art, and it's uh, there's various services. Um, is one called Dali? Yeah, Dali yeah. was the big one. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, Mid Journey as well, which can create some genuinely amazing pieces of artwork. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole host of them, and they, they, they just, you know, you type in a prompt to give it an idea, and then it comes back with something based on that. Now, that's an example, because that's been around for months and months now, and... But the whole AI thing, it isn't brand new in terms of uh, helping creators, let's say, uh, or the uh, definition of what's actually being created and what isn't being created by a human is obviously uh, up for debate when it comes to AI. For example, some SEO, search engine optimization technology, some of the companies that offer those services, they will offer AI-generated titles for articles. Uh, some of them will offer content suggestions for articles, and that's been going on for some time. If you use a WordPress blog, for example, you'll get content generations, ideas from certain SEO providers. But when it comes to chat GPT, that's very much a brand new thing early in 2023. So when this first came along, I uh, went off and had a bit of a play. In fact, it wasn't even with chat GPT, I don't think. It was with one of the other ones. Throw some names at me, Gavin. Um, there is the GPT Playground, I believe. Um, there's another one called UChat. Uh, and there are various uh, tools, uh, and this was definitely before uh, ChatGPT became such a big thing, where you could punch in, you know, a few keywords on a topic that you wanted and it would try and generate a few unique ideas for articles or ah, headers yeah, that and sounds... stuff like that. Yes, that's exactly what it was. It was at Jasper AI I was using. Oh, I think I've used that as well. Um, when yeah, for the same sort of reason, like oh, come on, this can't be as good as um, people have have made out. Um, yeah, and I don't know about how how you found it, but I found it very mixed. I found it awful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I attempted to get some um, articles written on the top topic of VPN for my VPN website just to see how they turned out, and I think probably one of them was usable. The others were nothing more than drafts that I had. To, I mean, the one that was usable, I had to rewrite twenty percent of it. The others, I had to rewrite about ninety percent. They were they were drafts at best, outlines. You know, they were poor. Yeah, and I think with tools like this, a lot of people have said, "Oh, people are going to lose their jobs, um, and people are going to be out of work immediately." Especially things like programmers, uh, writers, editors, uh, anything that involves basically anything to do with text, because it's a generative text tool. Um, and if this AI can, uh, you know, generate it uh, faster and with more precision than a human can, 
we'll all be out of jobs. However, the reality of it is, and from what you've seen, and from what I've seen, and, and from what various of the writers and editors that make use of have seen, is that the information it spits out is uh, basic. It's yeah, It's not structured and formulated in a way that would make it a pleasure to read over an extensive period. So perhaps as a short, sharp, snappy article, 300 words perhaps, it can do that. But once it starts getting into anything longer than that, the sentence structure delivered by something like ChatGPT or any of the other ones, it falls away. Um, and it's like it's like reading in a robotic voice, basically. No sentences longer than, say, you know, five to ten words. There's no, there's no personality to it either. That's the other thing. The article I'm speaking of, um, I'll provide in the show notes, it's called basically, You Can Now Get 15 Gigabytes Free VPN Data with Microsoft Edge, which was published on Compare VPNs. Dot co dot uk on the 24th of December, which, um, now what I did, I actually created a user that I was going to use, uh, sort of like, that would be the author of pieces, so I knew which ones were created uh, using that sort of technology in the future. But what it ended up happening is I ended up putting my own name to it, because I wrote, rewrote 90% of what it had provided, and it was a very straightforward topic, it was about a new feature on Microsoft Edge, which was quite well known around the web at the time. Now the point of this is that um, these AI services, they're all basically reading the internet, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. So that's where the debate between, you know, is is ChatGPT and other generative AI tools, are they creating fresh new content or are they plagiarising the work of humans uh, and everything that has gone before it? And because, um, as we were saying earlier, these are language learning models so they can only learn from what has come before it i mean at least at the current time um so if it writes an article on yeah like you said the latest vpn tech it can only write based upon something that was already written and if that is a particularly new and fresh topic it will definitely struggle and one of the things to remember as well with uh, at least with chat GPT, is that it has only been trained on information up until the end of 2021. So if you ask it about something that you know has happened or say a product or software, for example, that was launched in 2022, it can't give you an answer on that. Um, and they will update the data set at some point, I'm, I'm fairly sure. But because it was launched at the end of 2022, that wasn't possible. So it's sort of always playing a little a little bit behind. Um, but that comes back to what you were saying. Like, is is it stealing is it stealing content or uh, is it making it itself? Now, we've um, obviously we've talked about chat GPT on Make You Talk quite a bit over the past few weeks. I want to um, pull up something um, just just to give you a better idea of what it is that we're talking about and what this technology can do. There's, we've got a list of 11 things that you can do with chat GPT. Okay, so I'm going to go through the list and then we'll have a little bit of a chinwag about it at the end. So, for example, number one, you can quickly write a customised resume and cover letter if you're job hunting. You can create original jokes. Mm. You can explain complex topics. You can solve tricky math problems step by step. That sounds useful. Uh, you can get relationship advice from a robot. Um, <laughs> you can write music in almost any genre. Many people would argue that that's been going on for quite some time, AI created music. Uh, write, debug, and explain code. Again, that sounds useful. You can create content in multiple languages. Prepare for a job interview. Write essays on almost any topic, and that's going to come with its own host of pitfalls. I would not recommend doing that if you're sitting, uh, if you're being assessed uh, in an educational setting. And it could also be a chat companion if you're lonely or just want to talk to someone. Uh, I'm very dubious, very, very dubious about number two, create original jokes. Well, that comes to, like it can only know it can only know jokes that are written online, so it can never be original. This is the example. Why hasn't with the prompt write a joke about foldable smartphones and why Apple hasn't made any? 
Why hasn't Apple made any foldable smartphones yet? Because they can't figure out how to fold their prices. <laughs> I, you know, I am, um, confession time. I have a very, very um, deep ambition to do, to, to sell funny material, basically. And uh, you haven't got anywhere where this, this comedy career, but it's better than that. Yeah, it has to be better than that. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. The, the relationship advice one was the one that got me. Um, oh, it's, I can't imagine asking the robot for relationship advice, you know, like it says in our article. Just like any AI system, it can't exactly understand emotions. Um, <laughs> but, but what it can do is scrape the web for every single article on how to feel like you are in a relationship so it can present a false feeling of this is advice that is expected but it's the same advice you could read on any other website yeah that already exists yeah. so having the option to type in i need relationship advice to chat gpt is is therefore no different to just typing it in google anyway yeah yeah that, and that's the thing. But then again, I mean, we've got this whole situation with Bing and its um, AI-powered search, haven't we? I've seen a uh, paper article over the weekend basically saying that Google's completely missed the boat on this and there's poss a potential rebalance of search engines. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure that that is what will happen. But I, I, if they're, I mean, they're definitely playing catch-up, Google, like we, we were talking about at the start of the show uh microsoft also released um an ai search competitor to chat gpt and google bard uh it was last week as well wasn't it uh, early february 2023 yeah it definitely worked a lot better than uh google bing but um google bard google sorry. bing it's google like, bing google <laughs> bing he said he sounds like he's like a 1940s dancer yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's uh, we're just going to have to see effectively where the generative search goes for because it's like an arms race now between Google and and Microsoft and you could well imagine Chat GPT to perhaps enter the fray with uh, more advanced versions of um, of Chat GPT. They're all already. Um, have released um, the premium version of the tool. So one of the issues facing people that wanted to use ChatGPT uh, was that its popularity rocketed overnight. It went from yeah. you know a few million users to I think the last count was they had over a, a hundred million users um, in just under two and a half months after its launch. Which I mean that is that is staggering, isn't it? It is a lot. So yeah, so for context, it took Facebook four and a half years to reach that number, WhatsApp three and a half years, Instagram two and a half years, and Google almost a year to reach 100 million users. Like that, that is staggering amounts of people all trying to pile into this one app. And this is why they've launched their paid version, is it? Mm. Yeah, so the problem is you would go to ChatGPT and you have to log in um, with your account, um, and then the demand for it was so high, you just can't log into it and use it anymore. So the premium version, uh, I forget how much it costs, to be honest, off the top of my head, but uh, it's a monthly subscription. It's been rolled out to, well, supposedly just to people in the US, but we know people uh, make use of in the UK. Uh, I think one of our colleagues in Nigeria has also got access to the premium. I think it's $20 um, a month. $20 a month, that sounds right, yes. Uh, and it gives you basically a, a premium tier. It will always work. Your results will be faster. Um, you know, you will never be put into a queue and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then the premium tier should help to free up the free tier. Uh, and it should also help to subsidize the money for the free tier. So um, Air, OpenAI, who, who own... ChatGPT estimated that by the end of, I believe, by the end of 2023 or halfway through 2024, they would have lost over a billion dollars just on the sort of processing and hosting alone. Because behind the scenes, there's an awful lot of computing going on. Uh, and especially if they've got hundreds of 
like hundreds of millions of users. And there's a few reasons behind ChatGPT's growth. Uh, so in our article on uh, Make Use of dot com, um, there are three main reasons behind ChatGPT. So it's uh, it's Chat ChatGPT is versatile and incredibly useful. Uh, and so, like we were talking about a minute ago, you can ask it effectively anything. Uh, and if it's within its remit, it will give you the best answer it can possibly think of. Now, whether that's accurate uh, or indeed actually useful is down to your interpretation of it. But it will try its absolute hardest to give you the information you need. Uh, and although we were just talking about the premium version, uh, the second reason is that it is free and it's incredibly simple to use. You go to the website, you, you log in, create an account and just punch in whatever you want an answer to and it will give you the answer. Like almost anyone can use it. It's as simple as using uh, Google and especially like Google in its early days where search was, it was easy to find very specific things within the search. Yeah. And the third reason is that ChatGPT is heavily community driven. Um, and that's because the popularity has soared so much that on numerous forums uh, and places like Reddit or what have you, there's loads of different people talking about this, discussing ideas, um, finding ways of how to search for things, um, like giving it niche type prompts so it responds in specific ways uh, and what have you. So um, I think the whole thing is interesting and i think it's going to grow even more yeah and just in terms of the um because i i think our listener might be concerned about the amount of money that's behind it various people have been involved with the creation of open ai uh among which elon musk who uh, resigned from the board in 2018 because uh, tesla was working on ai so there's clearly a lot of money uh elon musk and former y combinator president sam altman co-founded open ai in 2015 so, as Gavin mentioned, the uh, the amount of money that's behind it, um, that's where it's coming from. Other Silicon Valley characters, including uh, Peter Thiel, LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman, pledged $1 billion to the project in 2015. It's a lot of money, isn't it? It is. A lot of money. A lot of money lot floating of money. around. But a lot of these people, they're all very recognisable names in, um, in the world of tech, uh, and a lot of them have... You know, vested interest in making this better, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, so we were talking about um, chatting to an AI earlier, weren't we? And uh, we've compiled a list of AI chatbots that you can talk to, and it says here, for fun and help you overcome loneliness. I'm dubious as to whether that uh, second point is achievable, but if it works for you, then um, good luck. Uh, so number one is replica which has 10 million users. Number two, there's chai, which sounds like something you would drink. Then there's uh, Kuki, a famous social companion made using artificial intelligence, markup language and machine learning. You can also play games with that character, uh, such as tic-tac-toe. And you can also send it gifts, which that's just... Sim Simi, Anima, Kajiwoto which lets you build your own AI bots and chat with them. Uh, there's Cleverbot, which has been going since 2006, which provides funny, clever answers and can tell you jokes, apparently, although presumably not ones it's just created. And there's a, a, a dual tool called Boybot and Eevee, developed by the same team with the same features. Boybot's male, Eevee is female. And InWorld, which makes it easy for non-techies to create their own AI characters and chat with them. So, yeah, so AI-friendly chat bot. I'm. I mean, we've all used chatbots, haven't we? When you, well, I say all of us, you may not have done. I have. I'm assuming Gavin has as well. Because if you're using an online service and you want to talk to someone, uh, quite often you don't actually get to talk to someone once you've um, specified what the actual problem is, and then it gets filtered through and you know um, triaged off to the right person, and then there's more sort of automated bits, and those more automated bits, that's when you're talking to some sort of intelligent chatbot semi-intelligent chatbot, not necessarily an AI chatbot. Um, ChatGPT, this is, I mean, this is a good opportunity for a lot of companies to use ChatGPT, isn't it? To solve that problem of crap chatbots. Yeah, so this is definitely what the, um, the language model learning side of it is all about. So anyone who has used those chatbots you're talking about, the frustration of the chatbot not being able to understand context 
is one of the biggest frustrations, isn't it? You type to the chatbot, I have a problem with X, Y, Z, and it goes, oh, is your problem, you know, something completely different? <laughs> yeah, go, exactly. Yeah. And you start hammering on your keyboard. You go, no, that is not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me talk to a human. <laughs> it's immensely frustrating. Which is the language which re- learning. Speaking to a human is rarely an improvement these days anyway. Well... That's a whole different issue. <laughs> uh, but the language learning side of it is what enables and what will enable tools like ChatGPT to better integrate AI chat into all sorts of different areas. Because as anyone who has used it and as listener, when you go and use it after you've listened to our podcast, you, you'll note that it picks up on the nuance of what you are typing and that is what makes it such a valuable tool and it's why from here on in we will only see more of this it's not i don't think this is one of those flash in the pan moments where oh it looks like a shiny new toy but it disappears within a year this is something that's been building up for for a very long time at this point so the the the, the chat the model that ChatGPT is based upon, GPT-3, um, has been in development for a very long time and is more powerful than its two predecessors. And they were also worked on for a long time. And it has just an unfathomable amount of data points to draw upon to make it sound and react and understand um, human-based input, but also to spit out um language that also sounds right to a human i'm looking at an article we've um, recently published called you can now create ai generated videos from text prompts text to video is now a thing i must admit i've not used one of these have you no i haven't i didn't even know it was a thing until uh, i was researching for this show uh there's oh, there's a tool called gen one uh, by a company called runway which uh, has various modes, stylation, storyboard, mask, render, customization. And yeah, it's a video generation AI system that efficiently generates video in any style while retaining quality and flexibility. I imagine it's got very good um, possibilities for advertising, also for people who want to do pastiches of some sort. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, a... Many years ago now, when I first started working for Make Use Of, uh, I wrote an article about a tool that Google were releasing or playing with, and it was basically an app on your phone that used your camera, and you would point it at an object, say, on your desk or whatever. So, you know, in front of me, I've got a keyboard, and it would use the camera to first identify what it was you know oh i'm fairly and then it would tell you in a voice like a an automated voice oh i think that's a keyboard but then it would also then write a little song about it with some music behind it (laughs) so just seeing this uh the text prompt thing is just reminding me of that and it was incredibly basic and the songs you know were not very good but it was quite an interesting look at how where we are now compared to where that was say six or seven years ago and you can see the very clear lineage between pointing something at um an object and it recognizing it to to what we have now where you can write a prompt and it will create an entire video for you wow okay we're going to um finish off with um because we've talked largely about chat gpt isn't the only text generator ai game in town Okay, so there's a tool called ChatSonic, which uh, runs on the same technology as ChatGPT itself, which is um, the underlying technology is GPT 3.5. There is another tool called GPT 3 Playground. This was a platform for the public to play with the GPT 3 AI model. Didn't create as much buzz, but it's uh, still there to play with. And then there's UChat, uh, which, like every other chat GPT alternative, uh, is powered by GPT 3.5 AI and uh, is has been interwoven into U.com's search engine. Yeah, so those are the various things that you can do. Um, they're alternatives to chat GPT, but they're basically using the same underlying technology (laughs) 
Although before we do our recommendations, Gavin, it's 2023. And as we've just established, you can uh, type in a text prompt and get a video or a song or relationship advice or jokes. Um, is this the future we were expecting? It's the precursor to flying cars. <laughs> <laughs> Something's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think for a lot of people, this is the start of much closer AI integration into regular lives. We already have a lot of uh, AI machine learning stuff in a lot of businesses. Uh, a lot of big organizations use a lot of this technology already to, you know, progress their stuff. But in terms of like, consumer facing ai that anybody can use i think this is going to be the 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 real starting point for it um and like i said earlier i don't th it's not a flash in the pan this this is the beginning of it proper where yeah. everybody will be able to use ai in some form or another and within the next few years it will be everywhere you know all yeah. much better integrated into products we already use so think about how people use their alexa or siri or or whatever any other um, search assistant tool with and they're already pretty good if you ask them a question, they can give you a pretty solid answer, but imagine how much better they're going to become when they have better integration with these tools. Now, the companies running those tools, uh, Amazon uh, and Apple, the two that I mentioned, they're already using this AI stuff behind the scenes. It's just only going to get a hell of a lot better from here on in. Yeah, we're basically not going to know that we're using it in many cases, are we? No, and that should be the goal of it, really. And yeah. I think that's why people actually enjoy using those tools like Alexa and Siri and what have you, is because it doesn't feel like, you know, it, it doesn't have that word AI attached to it, does it? And for a lot of people, that's probably good. Um, for some people, the words AI, I don't know, maybe it has a bit of a stigma attached to it because of all the films we've watched uh, mm -hmm. in the past. But now those films will sort of, A, look way more realistic. <laughs> And um, maybe a little bit more chilling, almost. <laughs> yes, yes, undoubtedly. Okay. It's recommendations time, that part of the show, which we uh, bring you a recommendation of something that we've enjoyed, watched, experienced, played, had delivered, hit over the head with, I don't know, any of those things. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, who's going first this week, Gavin? Uh, you want to go first this week? You can go Not first. at all, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing the 2018 Spider-Man game on the Steam Deck, and it's abs I'm not talking about the quality of the game, because it's well known to be a great game. The way it plays on the Steam Deck, which, quick reminder, uh, runs SteamOS, which is Linux. Every, it's just amazing experience playing games on the Steam Deck. And games like as good as that. I mean, when I first got the Steam Deck, I was just playing old games. I wasn't trying to push it too much, but you know, I was playing my favorite games. I played uh, a game called Zool uh, from uh, 1990, 91. Uh, I played a game called um, Half Life 2, which everyone knows probably uh, from about 2003, 2004. Uh, so, you know, I was playing old games to start off with, and then I started, and then I played Thief, but itself is about 10 years old now. And then I went for Spider Man. And I, the whole taking a thing that you can connect to a TV, then picking it up and walking off with it to play, like a game console, like the Switch, and like the Steam Deck. I don't know why people persist with Xboxes and Playstations, because that, this is the future, taking the console with you. But yeah, so I'm still excited about the Steam Deck, basically. That's good. I still haven't used one. I gave my version of it to one of our colleagues. Yeah, crazy man. <laughs> Yeah, which sort of looking back at the time felt like the right thing to do so he could actually do a review of it. But um, yeah. <laughs> I've still not got around to actually buy one myself. Uh, but they do look absolutely fantastic. And like you said, the ability to actually play such a wide variety of games like from Steam and elsewhere on a portable is uh, is fantastic. It is. I mean, I've got... Good old games and Epic Games setup, so I can. Uh, I mean, the compatibility of Epic Games isn't great. Good old games is fine. Uh, I haven't even got round to the whole thing. You can install Bato Kira, 
Batocera, Batocera, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, just with um, with an SD card. And it doesn't nice. replace the OS. You just you put in the SD card, and it boots from the SD card, and then you've got the whole retro gaming environment. You know, you've got a proper retro gaming environment to play with, as well. And that's just one thing. It's such an amazing, versatile machine. And of course, you know, if you need to do some work, you can plug in a keyboard, mouse, and display, and boot into the desktop mode. It's fantastic. It's quite amazing they kept it so open, didn't they? Yeah, uh, Steam during development because they could have really locked down the whole device and be like no you will only use steam os absolutely and that's all you get you know yeah uh which i don't think well it wouldn't have, obviously wouldn't have been as good as it is but it would still wouldn't have made it a necessarily a bad device because you would still have your entire steam library available wherever you went but yeah. it's all the extra stuff that you can do which makes it so good yeah i'm just so pleased with it it's a really good investment i mean i'm i'm saying investment i'm Obviously, not going to make my money back on it, but you know, in, in terms of you know something that I've bought that I have not regretted. I you know I've bought all sorts of things over the years. I've regret. I once bought a record player and I regretted it because the sound quality was terrible. It was one of those, uh, you know, when they um, they started coming out again, record players. I bought like an eighty pound record player, um, and it sounded terrible. Really, did sound bad, so I flogged it. Yeah, yeah. Record players are one of those. Oh God, they can. They can go really bad. The people would buy those uh, the Crossley ones in the suitcases and then go, "Why? Why does this sound bad?" It was one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, they just the, the needles on them just aren't high quality enough. Yeah, exactly. So, what's your recommendation? Uh, mine is also of uh, a gaming nature, actually, Christian. Um, so, in October of 2021, for the site, I reviewed a product called the Nacon MGX. It, it's an Android controller for a smartphone. So, you slide your phone into the, the case itself. You know, it slides open. You put your phone in it and it locks it into place. It connects via Bluetooth. And then you can play uh, games using an actual gamepad for your phone. Um, I've had this, like I said, since October 2021, but it's only in the last sort of six months that I've started using it like more and more frequently because um, it's a great little additional thing that turns your phone into a handheld. Now, it doesn't have the same range um, as the Steam Deck as we were just talking about, but um, if you can boot up a few emulators on your smartphone um, or, you know, you have good android games on there like um so one i've been playing a lot is dead cells which is a great game uh -huh. and it works extremely well with the controller it's um it's styled um uh in the same way as an xbox controller it has the the xbox logo the uh, x y a b um buttons um and it has the triggers the only thing i would say about the triggers actually is that they they don't really give a lot in terms of responsiveness. Say if you're in a driving game or a racing game, they don't seem to be able to give like um, throttle control. So if you accelerate, you you do get some throttle control, but it seems to be more like it goes quite fast. So you've got to be quite careful with it. Right. Um, but overall, um, as a relatively... Um, solid device uh it doesn't weigh weighs 200 grams i think fits into any bag um and you can take it anywhere with you so uh, yeah it's it's a great little portable i think what makes it how much it... it's uh nacon n-a-c-o-n they also make controllers they also make um arcade gaming sticks uh but i also think they do a bit of game publishing as as well so um they're, they're, they're all over it i have one a similar device but it's kind of it's older now it's an ipega and it's bluetooth um i'm not sure what model it is it should say somewhere but it doesn't um it's one of those stretchy ones so it'll uh it'll, it'll, it'll hold a tablet as well as a phone now i am um, i've barely used it because i found the controls were a little bit loose and wobbly but uh -huh. i did find you know what i did i installed steam link on my uh, android phone at the time and then i installed strider on my pc the uh, remake of strider from about 2014 2015 and then played that on my android it's probably a screenshot of it i'll make use of um and it played really well, although it didn't. It, although controls felt a bit loose, I actually found that I was really enjoying the experience of playing like that. Yeah, 
It is quite nice, I think. Um, like I said, like anything that can turn your... Anything that can turn a product that you already have into something that's even better. I was like, I'm, I'm here for that. It, you don't have yeah. to go out and buy loads of new tech. It's just this one thing. I've just looked it up. It now costs less than $100. And it will turn your existing smartphone... Because like, let's not forget, like modern smartphones are super powerful now. Like you could play so many different types of games. You can even get a PS2 emulator for Androids. Yeah, you know? it's crazy. Like, that would be unheard of a few years ago. Like about playing your best PS2 games, or I'm sure it won't be long until we get Xbox emulators for Android and what have you. So um, yeah, I'm 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 all about this. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so well, that's the end of our recommendations. That's the end of our OpenAI slash ChatGPT special make use of uh, really useful podcast. Everything you need to know that we've discussed, you'll find in the show notes. If you need to get in touch with us, um, our tweets, tweets, our Twitter account handles, our Twitter handles are in the show notes as well, and pretty much uh, everything else that you need. If anything's useful to you, please share it. I really hope that if you've got a relative or friend that doesn't really understand what's going on with uh, ChatGPT and AI and all that sort of stuff, and they've seen it in the news, share the, this podcast and hopefully that will uh, clarify a few things for them. We'll be back next week. Until then, it's goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>